everybody. As you just heard, um, we are going to go ahead and record. So we normally do anyway, but especially today to make sure we can get this to folks. Um, welcome and thank you for taking the time to join us today. My name is Shalawi Hugo. I'm one of the co-chairs of the IDEA committee. Um, and we're so happy to have you for our March meetup. Um, and we are excited to have Joan and Amelia with us today for a discussion about accessibility. Um, but first, I'd like to take just a quick moment and update you on a few of the things that the committee has been working on recently. Um, there's always a lot going on behind the scenes um, with work on things like information for the policies and procedures, which you are all welcome to check out on the website, um, that thrilling reading. Um, but there's always something we're kind of uh, working on for that, um, as well as communicating with our members. Um, some of the more visible items that we've been working on include our presence on social media and in e-news, um, trying to continue to find ways to connect with our members, um, hosting our online meetups, and then preparing for the National Conference in Orlando this summer. Um, there we will be hosting two afternoon meetups, like what we did in LA, if you were there. Um, the first one is immediately following the annual membership meeting, and then the other one will be at noon on Tuesday. Um, so this is an informal time to ask questions, voice concerns, and generally share your thoughts with the committee and with others who are attending. Um, in addition to these events, we'll be hosting our first roundtable session uh, at the conference with Puerto Rican composer Johanny Navarro, and that's on Tuesday morning, June 18th at 9.30 a.m., um, and all of this can be found in the conference schedule. Um, I also wanted to remind you that we are on the website. Um, you can find us under the Explore tab. Um, or at harpsociety.org slash idea. There you'll find information about the committee members, links to resources and upcoming events, um, archived recordings of these meetups, our email address, and you can subscribe for emails and event reminders. And we are always excited to hear from our members and work with you to continue bringing inclusion, diversity, equity, and access to all members of the American Harp Society. So thank you again so much for joining us and thanks for your patience with the tech issues. Zoom's always throwing something new our way, it seems, that did not happen last time. Uh, but thanks for being here and I'll go ahead and turn it over to Juan to introduce our guests. Thank you, Chalali, and welcome everybody to today's meetup. Um, it is so exciting for us to be hosting this accessibility panel and discussion with Amelia Romano and Joan Rayburn Holland. Um, we're so thankful that they were both able to and willing to give their time to us, um, both as already committed and invested board members for the American Harp Society. Um, we really appreciate having both of you here. Um, just a little bit about each of them um, to get started. Amelia Romano is a concertizing lever harpist, so maybe not a title that we're all as familiar with or encounter as much, but kind of also really, um, you know, kind of this crucial idea to today's discussion about like how we make the harp accessible to people. I really admire Amelia's work and how she's bringing some of these larger or more kind of standard repertoires and making them accessible and playable at the lever harp. That's something that we kind of engage and discuss with so much as harpists ourselves. Um, so I'm really interested to hear her thoughts. We also have the wonderful Joan Rayburn Holland, who is the professor of harp at the Interlochen Arts Academy and the University of Michigan. Uh, Mrs. Holland has so much experience with teaching so many students, so many different students from so many different backgrounds, as well as so many different focuses and goals. Um, so we're really excited to hear all of your thoughts on kind of the challenges that we have with accessibility at the harp, your thoughts on how we can start to tackle those challenges and of course have a really, really exciting discussion. So thank you all and we're really excited to get started with this. I think Robin is going to be doing most of our administrating of questions and whatnot. So Robin, please take it away. Okay, okay. Well, you know, I'd like to start just kind of with um, asking our our speakers to maybe just uh, and uh, just kind of an introduction, you know, most people know exactly who you are, but especially because this is being recorded, I always love that kind of intro. And I'd like Miss Holland to maybe just say even how you got into teaching and why you're teaching. We won't go to like, why do you play the harp? But it's your it's your floor to say anything because people really love that answer also. Why do you play? So anything you want to tell us about yourself right now, and then we'll throw it to Amelia. Thank you so much. Okay, let's see. Um, so as a ki young kid, like seven, I started piano at seven, and I was just really drawn to um, 
all the keyboard instruments, I think maybe mostly because of the music. And we moved to Pittsford, New York, which is close to Eastman. And Lion and Healy, this is important actually, Lion and Healy was paying Eileen Malone to give free harp lessons to kids who were interested. Yeah, it was amazing. So we shared a troubadour harp. So we only got it for half the week, um, but we shared a troubadour harp and she gave us free lessons and several of us got the harp bug and we eventually bought harps. So I don't know what she was paid, but I have a feeling that she was paid about the cost of one concert grand. And then, you know, down the line, we've purchased more Lion and Healy harps. And so, I mean, it's a great idea for any harp company to consider doing this. They got so many harpists from this program. Um, you know, I don't know, free lessons. It was, it didn't seem at that time, like it was much sweat off their back. <laughs> I don't know, because so many people bought the harps. It was just a very successful program. So um, so I played piano and harp for a long time and then just focused on harp. But I've always had um, this desire to, or an excitement to share what I discover on my own. And so I think that that was kind of my natural path into teaching, just because I like to do it. I probably talk too much. I spent a lot of time in the corner in elementary school for talking too much. So that maybe also helped with my natural tendencies for wanting to teach, but. Well, you know, it's such a great thing, a great idea when you say, you know, you just love sharing what you've learned yourself and what you've done yourself. What about you, Miss Amelia? Yeah, so I've always played the lever harp, and I was very lucky as an elementary school student to go to the Waldorf School. And mm -hmm. I say that because I got exposed in third grade to the lever harp, mm -hmm. and it just, I instantly knew that was the instrument that I wanted to play. And I had a friend at the time that was already studying with the teacher. So that made it easy because we loved hanging out together. I got exposed to the harp that way as well. And then once I convinced my parents to get me some lessons, I was kind of off and running. And I think one of the key pieces for me was growing up in harp ensembles. By within a year of playing harp, I was part of an ensemble of five harpists. And then two years later, my harp teacher, Diana Stork, um, founded the Bay Area Youth Harp Ensemble. So I spent about a decade playing with my peers on lever harp. And there wasn't really a distinction of pedal versus lever, it was just everyone played lever, and we all learned arrangements of Latin American to um, Greek to Middle Eastern, all styles of music. But it just kept us energized with the instrument. And once I went off to college, I just was so in love with the instrument. It was kind of just my identity. So I looked for all these possibilities to bring it into different elementary schools using harpsicles. And um, Diana Stark started a nonprofit, the Multicultural Music Fellowship. And she constantly got me engaged in bringing harpsicles to the elementary school. So I did that for many years. And then I actually spent a year in South Africa about a decade ago where I brought harpsicles there as well. So I think just like you're saying, Joan, my love of the instrument, it was like this idea that if I love it and I share it with others, it's contagious. And I really have seen that time and time again. So where you guys are now and where you are now, how, what, what capacity do you teach in and how do you go about getting students now when you're not traveling around? And we'll start with you, Amelia, and then go to Joan. That is a great question. I think, I think back to what, ignited my curiosity and passion and I kind of go forward with that so I've gone into lots of schools over the years and just done presentations and I'll do history of the harp presentations because I think when people get a sense of the role of the harp in the music world not just hearing it as an instrument there's an intrigue and curiosity beyond just oh I like the sound like oh it has this illustrious history oh there's all these different kinds of harps from around the world and so I, whenever I want to engage new students outside of, you know, social media platforms and performances, I just go into schools, third, fourth, fifth grade schools or classrooms, and then I just present music from 
Latin American, to world, to classical, to show individuals that, especially with the lever harp, it's not just a folk-based instrument. If you love something, you can make it work, and I'm here for you. That's kind of the, the idea behind the process. I lost my mouse. Okay, Miss oh. Hall. <laughs> well, uh, actually, I've been at Interlochen for many years, um, and they have, or they had, we've got to try to bring it back. COVID changed a lot of things at, uh, for the summer camp. But we had beginning harp um, classes for the juniors, which is like 11, ages 11 to 13, and for intermediates. And we even had it for uh, high school kids. And, and for a long time, we had three, three beginning harp classes um, a day in the summer. And a lot of people came from those beginning harp classes. Um, I don't know, Rachel Ferris, Catherine Barrett, um, I think Erica Goodman. There were lots of people who got their start in these beginning harp classes. And it was great because, well, at the time they were there for six weeks. So they got a pretty good jump start, you know. Um, and we would help them either find a rental or, you know, troubadour or lever, or some of them pedal. Not many, though, not just from the beginning harp class. They usually would come back and do it again and eventually come back um, and be in just part of the regular harp programs there. So that's been a huge, uh, um, a really, I don't know what you call it, but a huge way to get kids to play the harp. So we're kind of concerned now because they took a lot of the electives out of the programming at at the Interlock and Arts Camp. Um, they still have this thing called instrument exploration. And so there's some, you know, it's like one day a week, which is not enough, but uh, it at least gives kids some opportunity to explore the heart. Um, I, you know, we really need to get more. The problem, I guess the whole problem was that the electives, the scheduling of electives was a nightmare. And so then they just took it out. So we're trying to have us be the one exception. Can we still have our beginning heart classes? So maybe we'll be able to, I don't know. I've been, I've been a squeaky wheel, so we'll see. Yeah. So that's my main source of getting people. Wait, Robin, we can't hear you. Well, that's it. I've been talking to you forever. Can we tell people who might not know, because I always think of these Zooms and now that everything gets recorded, my hope is that people who aren't even harpists will come upon this. So can you just really quickly tell everyone where interlocking is and what it is? And please keep being that squeaky wheel. Ah, okay. My grandmother told me to be a squeaky wheel, so. Um, Interlaken is about four and a half hours northwest of Detroit in Michigan. And um, we usually have a lot of winter up here. It's between two lakes. That's what the name stands for. Um, and maybe 60, 70 years ago, Joseph Maddy started the camp a music camp. It used to be called the National Music Camp. And then it enlarged to all the arts. And um, so now it's called Interlock and Arts Camp. And then about 20 years or so after it was a camp, he opened up the Interlock and Arts Academy, which is a boarding arts high school. So in this school, and can you tell us, and then to Amelia also, what you find the difference between teaching privately or teaching in groups to be? And what do you think the benefits are for both of them? Because now we're looking at accessibility for yeah. how we get you know, the hands on the strings. Yeah. Um, well, I always start with the classes, um, doing things as a class and, you know, clapping and counting and <laughs> kind of loud and yeah. But, um, and there's a certain amount of uh, 
quiet going on, but not really a, a ton. I mean, um, people like to, they're enthusiastic, they talk, they, you know, I mean, I've had lots of unusual kids uh, in these classes, really, you can, and you can tell when somebody's really into it. Um, so, and then what I would also do is then send them off to their own practice space and give them mini private lessons too, because people absorb at different rates and different things at different rates. So um, it's important to have a little one-on-one -on -one time, you know. Nice. And Amelia, um, I know that, you know, Joan has this school. Do you teach mostly privately or I think you do a lot of online stuff? Can you tell us a little bit about how you're reaching people that way? Yeah, that's a, a great question. I was actually just thinking about the group versus the individual format. And I think group is really important to especially younger students, just building peer to peer relationships. And for some individuals, they are most inspired and encouraged by seeing their peers do something or be challenged in a, in a positive way. And so there's, there's a learning environment in that that's really positive. I obviously haven't been in that environment as of recent in person. I used to do harp ensembles with my students as well as at schools. And I just enjoyed seeing the camaraderie there. But of course, the one-on-one, -on -one is, as Joan says, it's everyone has a different kind of speed and approach to learning. So you can really cater your information to that individual in a way that might kind of propel them forward in a different manner. So it's kind of, I find always a balance and a tug and pull. Each student is a little bit different. With the online format of teaching, I think it does work. Obviously we all do online like private lessons one-on-one. -on -one. In the group setting, I personally like online because you can reach more people all over the country and world depending but you can also have them be muted and be practicing something while taking in information from you. And there can be discussions in that setting as well. But of course, it really just depends on the age. I think for younger students, online can be distracting. Whereas for older students, online can feel more um, like a, a mix between a lecture and a um, like experiment session because Sometimes I'll actually have students play a section for me and share it with the group and they can learn by doing, and, oh, this person is also struggling here. And that opens up a different conversation than then if they were just doing it on their own. Uh, so I always have fun experimenting with, with virtual as, as an ongoing way forward. I tell you, the mute button is an amazing thing. And so when I'm hearing you talk, I'm like, oh, yes, online groups, you have the power to mute everyone. And then those kids aren't interrupting like they kind of do in person. Joan, you know, we're looking at all sorts of different learning disorders, um, different types of students. Have you had any experience with students who you know, have um, some type of label or even something you just see. And I'd like to get a good and a bad story. Y'all, we got to hear the bad too, because then we can work That's through. Right. So what was a good success and what was one that you were like, mm, wah, wah. Ah. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, I haven't had people actually say I, I'm dyslexic, but I, but then fi we find out later, yes, they are. And um, so I think I didn't, you know, I, I'm not trained in learning differences, although I did just read something about it that what people uh, with neurodiversity need is just really very much step by step. And um, so it's extremely clear, you know, that oftentimes when we start music lessons, we kind of jump for them to the second level and it makes it much harder. So this article was very good. It was a woman who was a cellist and also a teacher of people who have dyslexia. And um, so that was, it was good to read that article because I realized that I need to break it down even more for some of these kids who don't process as quickly. You know, we're all so excited about, wow, this person is so fast and but the truth is a lot of my kids who weren't, who didn't process that fast also had this like magical ear for sound. It was consistent. Um, just, you know, they were really bugged by um, sound. If it didn't sound a certain way, they could hardly 
go on, you know, or, um, okay, wait. So what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I really, I oh, a bad story. I, right. Okay. But no, with your good stories, the one thing I took from what you just said was really that step-by-step Right. You said step by step approach. You talked about individuals, how very different everyone is, and uh, kind of the textbooks and some of the things that we might have been aligned to. We still need that foundation, but we've got to be willing to kind of just like look at each student, you know, on their own. Amelia, yeah. what about you? See, I'm leaving the bad stories for later. Ah, okay. <sighs> you know, I like a good challenge because it really makes me pause for a moment as a teacher because oftentimes, you know, when you go, you move between your own practice session to having, having lessons with students, you're kind of still in your practice mindset. But when you find a student that just kind of stares at you blankly or, or kind of gets really quiet, it's a moment to ask them, like revisit the big questions, like what do you love about harp? Or when you're most alive on your instrument, what's happening? And sometimes like, Joan, you said, like, they'll just hear it and instantly be able to play the piece, but you give them music and they're paralyzed. And so I always tell my students, you know, I grew up playing a lot by ear and now I do both and I want to empower you to have the option. So even if it means just five minutes of sight reading a couple measures, that's okay. And then we go on to doing by ear. But I find it's a really great opportunity to especially in person to experiment with what works for them and kind of noticing their limitations because I did have one student that just had a really hard time focusing and it was all on Zoom. So it really more became a, he wanted to hang out and talk about music versus actual fingers on strings. But I've mostly learned to meet students where they are. And then other times I realize I've overstepped what they're needing because I define their needs before they got to tell me them. Well, that question you said, which I was like, oh, what do you love about harp? Mm -hmm. I like that question because you're telling them they love the harp. And I'm going to use that tomorrow. You're already telling them, I know you love it. What do you love about it? And it really, I think, can lead to you saying, what kind of pathway do you want me to give you? What do you want me to have you doing? And, um, you know, where do we want you? How are you dealing, um, Joan, with students getting the instruments? Oh, yeah, good question. Okay, but first of all... Let the cat out. We'll go to Amelia. You thanks. Let the cat yeah, okay. okay. I saw that. We'll go to Amelia. So, Amelia... You know, because that's one of the things that we're finding. I mean, especially, um, you know, we hate to keep saying post-COVID, but really post-COVID, people are moving a lot differently. How are you getting them to get these instruments in hand? Yeah, I mean, it, it a lot of different variables. I'm lucky right now that most of my students have their own harp, but mind you, we're talking about lever harps here. And when it comes to the topic of accessibility, I think it's important to say that lever harps are physically easier to move and financially easier to afford. So um, in a lot of cases, I think, as we talked about, I'm, I'm always arguing that lever harps can be training wheels to the pedal harp, but they can also be a, an instrument that stands alone on its own. But I think when we're thinking in the context of lever harp, I actually start off in with harpsicles, because I say to students, if you want to learn the, just like the basics of playing the instrument, the hand positions, all those things, and not so, so much worry about chromatic music yet and having a large range, you can rent a harpsicle for 40 bucks a month. Or you can, I mean, as I mentioned, Diana Stork and the Multicultural Music Fellowship, they have um, a nonprofit that helps rent out harps to students. So really, there's, there's no reason why a student can't put a harpsicle on their back and spend the first year learning the basic technique. Mm -hmm. And then from there, if they show more promise and they're really into it, there's always other options. Can you tell um, everybody and remind me again, I think I know, but where are you based? Because you're based somewhere and is the $40 a month something that's just where you are or can people go you're, to the website? Do they need to point. your whole financial portfolio to do this rental? Because a lot of times we say they can rent and it's like, well, yeah, but they got to fill out a tax form to do it. And where, where I live, that's just not happening. Yeah, no, exactly. So I, I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area. So prices are not very forgiving here. And 
And I feel like as artists, we are always, we always find a way. Where there, where there is a will, there is a way. And I believe that more and more, the more I live as a creative in, in the Bay Area. <clears throat> so I don't, I think the rental prices vary depending on shops and other, other details. But um, from my own experience working in, in the Mission District of San Francisco and going into different elementary schools, the same MCMF is what they're called. They were a nonprofit that would help. They basically had all these harp schools that um, Diana's students, parents, some of them just volunteered their money and said, oh, we'll buy a harpsicle and then put it as part of this nonprofit and then we can bring it into schools. And that was really a great option, especially within the first one to three years of student learning. And of course, we're talking about, you know, there, there now are sharpsicles, so you can actually play some chromatic music. So when it talks about just getting harps into hands, that was the most effective um, approach I've seen with um, the lever or just you know, non-levered harp, diatonic harp. Okay, here is a question, and it might be just personal to me, but I'm going to ask this, and then we're going to go to Miss Joan. And my question to you is, how do you have them sitting at these harpsicles? Um, oh, wait, is this for me? Oh, this no. Is for, this, yeah, is okay. for, um, this is for Amelia. Okay, good. I, yeah. I, th I, think, I think you're more of the big carp lady. I'm uh, not sure, but that's where I'm going to you from. But yeah, Amelia, how do you have them sitting? And are you just, how are you having them sit to learn on these? Yeah. So it's usually, usually younger elementary school students. And sometimes they'll have just a plastic chair with a little foam on top so that it's, the harp doesn't slide and they can actually put it on that little plastic you know foot off the ground and then they'll sit on a chair that might be a little bit lower than the average seat seating chair and that way they don't have to have it on their back and have all the weight there because for a lot of students it's hard enough to play lever or pedal just with posture but then they all of a sudden they have a strap pulling them forward and it can be pretty concerning quickly for young ones so that's the general practice and then of course you can stand with it and have the um strap around your back, but it's a, you have to be very conscious about it. Thank you. I think, um, you know, because you guys, we see, I often tell people the best lever harpists are the people who were pedal harpists and now they're playing it. You follow, you look at me and they're looking so comfortable. And then my kids are like, yeah, it's just not working. So I like that. And even that idea, and you see a lot of people also standing. I see you standing and playing Amelia. So that's great. Now, Joan, you've got those big harps. Where are these people getting, how are they coming to you and getting these harps? How are you teaching them? So some of the kids don't have their own harp yet, you know. I mean, um, most of them do. But, and I think they're buying second, you know, secondhand instruments. Some people are financially lucky enough to be able to have a parent who gets them their own harp or they um use this lion and healy trade up program you know where you buy yeah uh but we have a lot of older instruments at interlochen for example and also at university of michigan so at u of m there's eight harps i would say four of them are good and then the others have been donated, you know, and I say they're old ladies, you know, are you going to treat your grandmother like this? No, you have to be nice to the harp. <laughs> but I mean, I am supposed to come up with a plan now to give to the big financial powers to see if we can at least replace one or two. But yeah, so anyway, and same thing with Interlock. And we had a lot of really old harps there. We had one Wurlitzer um very small. We weren't really using it, which is a good thing because I've been at Interlochen for a very long time. So it, yeah, something like 44 years or whatever. And you know, yeah, nothing. Pshaw. So one day in my first two years of teaching, I went to, I left my studio. And when I came back, the neck of that Wurlitzer had completely crashed into the um, soundboard. And so I checked and yeah, nobody had knocked it over. It, it just gave way, you know. I mean, if somebody had been playing it, of course, that would have been a nightmare. But that's how old some of them are. Um, yes, I, ha I have a couple of harps ready to give up the ghost. And I tell yeah. people, 
send them to me. We'll play them till they explode. Okay, yeah, right. I want to ask you repertoire. So I want you to think what's your favorite, very beginner, beginner, middle, intermediate, or just even what is your favorite piece to teach and why? And Joan, I'm going to let you lead that off. Okay. Um, well, as far as beginning rep, I think Suzanne McDonald and Linda Wood did a lot of good giving us those graded books. Um, I have used some of the very beginning uh, tiny tales of Salzedo, but they're actually kind of complicated. I mean, it's it almost feels like a person has to have studied piano or something first for all that fingering. Um, they're good though. I mean, nice pieces, but so if you have somebody who's been a pianist, then that's a good option. Um, I just look around. Betty Pere, I think. Is that how you say her name? I always call her Pere, but I don't really know if it's Parrot. Anyway. She, uh, yeah. Those fun from the first, you know, any of those. Then I feel like there's a big need for intermediate rep. We have some. I mean, I think Bernard Andres has helped us with that. Um, but there's, we really need more. Renier has some, but especially middle to advanced intermediate rep, because then all of a sudden people are handing kids things like impromptu caprice or, um, uh, you know, Pichetti Sonata or, you know, it's just nuts and, and it's hard and they get all tense. And the next thing after they've gotten through that, they say, oh, can now, can I play Ravel? I'm all set. Can I, you know, <laughs> so we really need uh, more books that speak to that. Absolutely. And I think you should write some. Okay, Amelia, who does um, recreate and write. And so please talk to, if anyone doesn't know, this incredible work you're doing with taking some of these classics and making them accessible for a clever heart. And, uh, yeah, I was just going to start by saying that there's no book that I really turn to as like a go-to for beginners or intermediates. I really have a hard time using any particular script. Um, Teach Yourself to Play the Heart by Sylvia Woods. I appreciate the book because it has exercises mixed with folk music mixed with classical. And so I feel like I can kind of bounce around and I have a hard time following any like, okay, this is grade five, this is grade six. I tend to jump a little bit, so um, I hope my students don't suffer too much. But I also have a number of colleagues that just compose music, and so I often grab from their sources and find kind of, because they're not graded, what level is this, or where is the student at, and what style are they gravitating towards, and move, move from that point. So that's kind of my general beginner to late beginner teaching approach. Um, but because lever harp is considered more of a diatonic than a chromatic instrument, I decided to get my master's in classical lever harp performance and rework a lot of classical music that is totally doable on lever harp if you want to practice lever shifting a quarter, a quarter amount of the time that you're actually practicing, which I like it. So last fall, I put out classical reimaginations and it's... Um, 10 pieces from Noderman to Scarlatti works that were adapted for lever harp. And when I say adapted, um, the main changes I make is sometimes the BPM or uh, taking out the left hand momentarily and bringing out the right hand instead so that the lever shifts are happening. I'm not actually, I mean, for lack of a better term, dumbing down classical music to make it lever friendly. Uh, I, for some colleagues tell me I look like a mad scientist when I'm playing but it works and I think if you're closing your eyes you feel like you're listening to classical music in the sense of the the flow in chromatic motion that occurs so I think in terms of accessibility when I was thinking about this conversation uh, I want the lever harp to not just be training wheels and I want lever harp players to feel like they can cover whatever territory they want to and as I say if it's too hard on just solo lever harp make an ensemble arrangement so I've been doing a lot of here, here's a solo lever harp part that isn't quite doable, and now I'm going to make it into a trio version. And I do a lot of just reworking in that in that capacity. And that way, as a composer, I don't feel limited. It's not like, oh, I can't make those 20 lever shifts in three measures. I guess I can't write this. It's like, no, find the instrument that complements the harp and that will really bring out that line that's important to the composition. Because ultimately, people come to hear great music. They're not worried about how many lever or pedal changes you make. 
That's good. And I really love, I love how you say, you know, I don't use any of those other people's books and I'm not mad at you. I'd like anyone who has, you know, we're a small group here. And so if you have a question, if you have something you want to ask, you can put it in the chat and I'll definitely ask it. But you also can, um, if it's okay with my my bosses, my colleagues, you can unmute yourself and ask. This is, um, I'm so excited to have these two ladies here and to just being talking about, you know, this whole topic of getting people back into the harp, interested in the harp, what is out there? And you are absolutely right. If someone could do that dive for us, there is so many pieces being written. But as I say to people when they ask me, why don't I write? I'm like, because it would be boring. There's so many boring pieces out there that people write just because, sorry, yeah, I'm saying it, like, come on, we're not all composers. So maybe that would be something we put out to everyone. Like, we've got Andres, but who else? And what can we say is intermediate without being, as um, Joan said, too grown up? Like, all of a sudden, yes, it says tiny little sketches. Well, none of my tiny little people can do those tiny little sketches. So how do we um, get a list of that type of stuff? So please, you guys join the discussion. Anybody? Can I, can I make a suggestion? Hi, my name is Denise Fink, and I'm a teacher in the, um, I know Joan, and I'm Alice Shelf, who's a former student. It's been a while, but um, I teach five college students. And um, what I have found is to tap into the technology world. And uh, as teachers here, put yourself on YouTube playing that piece. We're going into a visual world, and that really draws in um, it gets rid of the fear of that starting student when they see their teacher actually playing that piece. Back in the day of Alice Shalapu, she would just get on the harp and she would just go all over the place. I'm like, wow, I just practiced that for six months and you just get on the harp. You know, um, so I just want to say, let's tap into the visual part. Um, Jackie, I use a lot of her YouTube videos for my students um, to demonstrate that. Um, she does a really good job of just going through her voices soft and just step by step, talking slow and kind of make a mini video um, for the general public. And the general public wants to hear more hard. You play a harp and and last night I was at a gig and they said, well, how much does that cost? And you know, a lot of harpists are getting on TikTok and stuff and, and going through the pedals. I think that's really where the Harp Society should tap into. People are doing it individually on their own um, to get rid of those of, I don't want to say anyone's fear of taking the harp. It's just getting rid of those. They're always a question, but no answer. So they go to piano instead because their friends are playing or flute their friends are playing it and they see they see the visual of their friend saying, oh, well, if she can do it, I can do it. So I think we should tap into, okay, I see my harp teacher doing that. I think I can do it because they just want um, gratification when they come to their lesson, that verification from their harp student um, saying you did a really good job. So in my students, I will verbally tell them, you have to pat yourself on the back and tell me out loud that you did a good job on that passage. They look at me really embarrassed, but then they feel, they go, I feel really good now. So it's that, you know, and I tell them, I'm not expecting the next lesson to be a concert. They always want to, they always want to make sure that the teacher's happy. And I'm like, no, I'm your team member. I'm not your, um, so there's just that division of, intimidation in starting the harp. Once they get in there's you were talking earlier about learning types. I, I took a management course and in, in business management, they talk about the four types of learning. And so there's auditory, constetics, um, which is touch, which the harpists love. They, that's how we learn through our the brain connects so if you're talking about counting, I have them count out loud because there's a brain passage when they count out loud versus the teacher counting, that pathway of the brain connects with their fingertips. And it's really hard at first for a beginner to count out loud. So I'll be patient, but then you see this breakthrough when they're actually counting. 
I also will have them do Delcros and stepping out the 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 piece that they're writing or or that they're playing because that's also a brainwave where they're then they go into the harp knowing the rhythm and not practicing the rhythm. Um, I hope this helps you, but that's some of the things that people about the first six months or first three months of taking lessons, they quit the harp because there's so much thrown at them just all at once on the harp. You talked about um, some of the tiny tales. You have to know the piano. If you do know the piano, you're coming to the harp and you're just transferring over. Those people will stay at the harp longer than the ones that just don't know any universal language or anything. So I start with the, um, the more theory books for someone that just walks in to my studio and I make sure they know all four books at the same time. I tell them those books have to be ahead. Of, you have to hand those assignments into me before I can give you a song of that theory. And they're all motivated like, okay, I know there's a motive. There's a forward motive going forward. They know exactly what the teacher is asking them. And so those books really match up with transferring the, the understanding of the harp. So I hope that helps, but the intimidation the first few months are really important that we as harp, harp teachers get rid of all those questions. Um, I don't have all the answers, but that's just what's working. No, this is no, this is really great. Denise, thank you so much. A couple of things with your saying. Now with the Dalcros and you said stepping out, you mean getting away from the harp and just stepping well, or clapping. At the Cleveland Institute of Music, um, if you've ever been around Alice Shell, who um Joan, you know, she had you take Delcros. It's it's a eurythmics. That that's a whole nother idea of meeting if you want to bring that in and up. But that is um, something where it's very valuable to the student to have that rhythm flowing. A lot of harp music will have one measure of quarter notes, but the next measure, I call it smashing technique, harp technique. The next one, you got to jump on the harp and you have to have a different um, rhythm. And for some students that don't have that sense of rhythm, you're asking them now to do technique, counting, and universal language of reading notes all at once. And it's an overload. And so I ask them to do the theory ahead of time so they can read notes. I know that they can do that because I can see their homework assignments. Then I have them go in my dining room. I have a wooden floor and step out the rhythm so that they can hear a, an internal eighth note. So when an eighth note comes up, they can go right into that eighth note or that quarter note and have that rhythm going all the time in their head. They don't, sometimes when you learn rhythm, you go by looks, your visual. I have them close their eyes and now they have to feel it in their body. And so we as harpists feel the rhythm in our body because it's in our fingertips. So I'm taking it from the brain of visual and put it into constetics. And then I do ask them what type of learning person they are and they will tell me auditory. Auditory people, don't have to take notes. They learn from you talking and demonstrating. That's where the videos come in. And, um, and so once again, it's trying, go ahead. No, no, no. I'm saying once again, you know, one of the main things I'm getting from you and has already been spoken, as you know, we really need to be looking at our students individually, yes. um, doing and coming up with individual plans for them and really all types of methods, looking at all types of methods. And I know, because I know there are some videos that some of the colleagues that I'm staring at right now that they have up and that are just wonderful. And so perhaps we um, need to, as AHS, um, look into, you know, um, getting a section, getting something where we're putting things up, because as there are wonderful videos, there are also horrible videos and for any of us uh wedding players i mean i just got a list sent to me for a wedding with um harp covers and i was very grateful because i was like well i sure i can play better than that so this kick is going to be easy but you know some people are just putting stuff up putting stuff up putting stuff up and so um amelia do you have a lot of your students you know really coming to you i know you teach on zoom and so as we start bringing this to a close are you using, how are you using, let's have our last questions be about how are you using technology with what you're giving and doing with the students? How am thank I, you, Denise. Yeah, thank you. How am I using technology? I mean, I enjoy teaching more the seminar 
uh, format virtually because I feel like it can be more of a lecture format and then students that want to try as they're hearing and have the hands-on can mute themselves and learn that capacity. So I find that virtual is just very helpful to have a simultaneous practice session while having the instructor right there. So you can ask questions and at the same time be learning and working on your own in your own time frame. Because again, when you're in person between the cacophony and the questions that require silence for an answer, there's just a different pace of content being being communicated. So I, I personally, even though you can't really work on phrasing easily, articulation, tone quality in the virtual setting. But most of my seminars are looking at how to take a piece of music and adapt it for the instrument, meaning lever harp, or where to notate passages and the lever shifts happen. And in that capacity, virtual is great. So it's, I think, with, with the virtual world, and that's how I'm kind of responding to your question, assuming that the technology was using the virtual world to communicate, what, what are the strengths and how can you play to them? Because uh, there's just certain things you can't do as easily, and so expecting that to happen is kind of setting yourself up for disappointment. And so, Joan, when I find you online giving us some talks I've, I've heard and admire you from afar for so long. Do you have anything for us? You're going to get us a TikTok up there? <laughs> um, you know, it just dawned on me that one of the best ways to introduce kids to our instrument is to take the program into the school you know, which Amelia said she does and many people have done and you do. I mean, it's a miracle. And and then there's that huge program that's actually developed in Atlanta and you have a similar one, right? In New Jersey, right? Yeah. So, I mean, you can't get any better than that as far as bringing the harp. And then of course they can actually touch it and feel it and see what it's like. But you know, why couldn't we also have some... Um, zoom introductory sessions that would be available to a teacher for their classroom about the harp i don't know you know if they would just say today we have something special or but um i think that would be also a good possibility i mean they couldn't touch and they can't play but then maybe the next step is that they would actually have the physical instrument so, and as far as technology, well, there's that. And then um, were you also talking about things like taking your harp to, to some line and Healy and having them put a mic in it? I heard Krista Grix play a harp of hers that's got this, is that what you, it's not a mic, but it's a, uh, you know, it's round and they actually drill into your soundboard and, and then you can attach it to a um, amp. We have mics and we have amps. And I even, hey, I have wireless now, you guys. Wireless. Oh, Thanks cool. to Ken Thomas down there. Pick up. Yeah, thank you. Technology yeah. stuff. He sends me this stuff. And so now I have a plug that I can plug in the back of my harp and right. plug it in the amp all the way over there. And it actually works. So right. for my school, we're doing a lot of that. And I think for all of us, there's just been so many great ideas. And even just when you were just saying we could have Zooms for beginning harpists and, you know, um, my my whole Harps for Life is about putting harps in people's hands. And so we really could come with a program and say, I called Delane and say, okay, Delane, you're going to get together all these harpists and we're going to be on this screen. And mm -hmm. I just saw um, Lyrica with all these little kids on harpsicles playing Wade in the Water. And I think oh. we just now need to like each one, wherever we are, I think that the possibilities do exist. I heard from and with Amelia and um, all the talk of the different ways of getting rentals. I also believe that everywhere that you are, there are people with harps in the corners of their houses. And so I encourage you guys before I retire and get to all your states and take the harps myself, reach out to them and let's get these harps playing. Let's get them working. As far as our accessibility, I want to thank Amelia and Joan. Like, There's just been so many things. Like, I'm going to come back and listen to this just that we're hearing. And I still think the main thing, and I'm so excited that all of you came and joined us. The main thing is that, first of all, everybody should be playing the harp. Let's just go with that. 
And there are just so many. I love that Denise talked about the TikToks and some of the things. Oh, yes, the Kathy Bundek Moore. And, and God bless you. See, I have all five of them in my classroom, and I'm going to I'm going to try to get my kids to look at them again. Oof, they are, you know, tough on that. Ah, and Ken says it's a pickup. But if you come up, anybody with any questions um, from this, anything you want to see us do, um, I think, Chalali, you've heard a lot of things kind of being required of the AHS. I heard them, and we've got Delane right over there, who I know is taking notes. But let's let's keep this work going. I hope that all of you are going to be in Florida and that you're going to um, come join everyone there. You can um, email in the bottom. It's to the idea at the harp society.org. And as someone who's online a lot, I want to encourage you to please tell others about this. I find that we get millions of more views of the replays, you know, and so people are really loving the accessibility that we're giving them just at any time. But I want to thank you all for faces and non-faces, but being there. Does anyone have any last words? Joan, I'll give it to Joan first and Amelia. No, it's been great. I'm so happy to actually sort of have a connection with you. <laughs> I only read about you and all that you do. So thank you for running this. <laughs> Will there be another meeting with like a follow up if you get a lot of responses to this meeting when you say that you get viewers? Could we have a follow up? Um, we are we are certainly open to that. Yeah, our plan so far has been because we've only been around a little over a year um, as this committee. Um, that we're trying to aim for about three to four um, meetups um, of different sorts per year. So um, about um, three online and then one at um, either the conference or the institute, depending on what year it is. Um, and so we are always open to um, ideas, concerns, questions you have, and um, we'll certainly you know take that in as we plan future meetups. Um, yeah, so if this is a topic that's of a, of particular interest, definitely let us know. Yeah, so going forward, we can we can try to include some some more things like this. Mm -hmm. Amelia, I I just appreciate everyone coming together to talk about this in terms of uh, how to just reach reach more individuals and really with the instrument being rather one of the oldest in history and yet most concerts I play, audience members tell me it's the first time they've been so close to a harp. And and I, I think it's important to note we have made a lot of progress as a harp community around the world. I think we're, our goal is to always look for new possibilities to reach new minds, but simultaneously I think it's exciting that we're just having these conversations and coming together to talk about what, what will keep will we'll bring us to the next concert and have someone come up and say, oh, I recently got to play a harp. It was so good to see it again versus I've never seen one, right? So the little baby steps. But thank, thank you so much, Robin. It's always oh. a pleasure to be in conversation with you. And I say that very, very sincerely. Each time we get I'd, on the Zoom, I'd, I'm like, yes. I'd like both you and Joan, if you can, to put into the chat any way that people can reach you. I'm so excited to see names that I know, Rachel, and I saw Laura, I think she might've had to leave. I think she's the president of one of the chapters. Um, I can call my students, Quinn, Nia, my colleagues, Crystal and Ken, and hi Vince, and we see you in there. It's just, it's just lovely to see all of you, Delane, I'll see you in Atlanta in a couple of weeks. And yes, please reach out, um, especially um, for the people who are looking for Leverhart music and classes for that, reach out. And I know that where Joan is, there are, I always hear of kids um, practicing and working to come uh, get scholarships to Interlock and in the come go to Interlock. And one of these days I'm gonna have a kid for you. Right now we're like <laughs> baby locking, but you know, <laughs> anyway. Everybody, it's been just my my extreme pleasure. I'm going to turn it over to Shalali. 
Um, I failed to give the opportunity in um, at the beginning to introduce uh, the members of the committee here. So like I said, I'm uh, one of the co-chairs. Our other co-chair, Elisa Torres, um, uh, could not make it today. She had a concert that was booked after we had already scheduled this, um, but she um, is thinking of everybody and uh, will be so excited to, to hear um, all the thoughts from today. Um, Robin, you all know, um, on the committee, Juan, um, there, there's Juan, um, is, uh, the first diversity coordinator as well for the American Harp Society, and Vincent is on as well. Um, so that's our committee. So just a heads up if you ever see us anywhere or um, you know want to be in touch, um, just so you know who the, the people on the committee are. And I will just echo what everyone has said. It's been such a pleasure being with you all today. Really appreciate you attending and especially hanging in there with the new <laughs> challenges Zoom decided to throw at us today too. Um, so thank you so much. Um, but this will be available. We'll let you know. We'll um, put information out in the e-news on social media platforms when we've got the video ready to go. Um, we do have videos from our October meetup. Um, if you were not able to attend that and you would like to check those out. Um, so information was in the e-news about that. Um, you can access the um, recording the full recording on YouTube. It's also on our website and we're going to have an actual archive kind of section at the bottom of our, our web page um, coming very soon. But it is actually linked if you look for actually Jackson's um, presentation there. So you can check that out. So you can always find these if you're not able to make it, but we certainly love having you here and seeing faces and meeting new people. So thanks so much everybody for joining us. I'll stay on for a minute if anybody wants to unmute and say hi or introduce themselves, ask anything. I'll go ahead and stop the recording.